How many of you are hiring for a company right now, whether it's a startup or not? Okay. So we will be, I'll be running around asking you, but after I introduce Sophie, we're, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Sophie Roney has been our recruiter and residence here at the research park for, I don't know, four years, maybe? Something like that. So uh, Sophie's background includes stints at um, two of the major tech companies in our community, but really uh, she's really made her mark as um, in, in her work as an independent person helping lots of different companies with their strategies, uh, as well as implementing, implementing such strategies for recruitment. And her, she has a lot of focus in ag tech, which of course is important in the research part, but has worked of course with many other industries as well. Uh, she is um, on our on our team, so to speak. So if you are a startup here at Enterprise Works, you can access time with her. So we do have a form on our website. Uh, if you go and look up um, recruiting and or etc., but it is on our website. So you can fill out that form, and we will just connect you with Sophie. If you can get some time to talk about you know, workforce strategy, things like job descriptions, like what are we doing wrong, what, what could we be doing better, things like how do I, you know, how do I structure our interview process. All these kinds of things that are related to the strategy around hiring a great team for your company. So uh, we are really happy to have Sophie back in person. Um, we, the, I think the last few workshops we've done with her have been virtual, so thank you so much for being here today. So this doesn't have to be a monologue. Please ask questions along the way if anything is confusing. Or you maybe have better data that you'd like to share with the group. Hopefully this is pretty accurate. I put it all together in the last two weeks. So it should be accurate data. Um, now, I did do a presentation similar to this in March that went over more broadly hiring for your startup, not drilling in on compensation. And the reason why we're drilling in on compensation is because of market conditions and also as a follow-up from that is that's where a lot of the questions were. So who is this for? Uh, employers, HR recruiting who do not specialize in compensation. If you do, then this might be repetitive, but this is a general overview of those who want strategies not detailed job evaluations, although I can point you in the direction of finding those. And we will go through a brief exercise today on how to find those. And then general compensation, not in terms of any type of leadership roles. So in 2019, before the big remote shift and before the market changed quite a bit in terms of making it really a talent market versus an employer's market, you saw more of the trends that you see in the red here. And so this presentation is more focusing on the future of the of competing for talent and retaining talent here. So many of you know that in our hiring, specifically for remote, and so that comes along with a, a slew of other flexibility options. Okay, so your goals of a compensation program are, of course, to be competitive. You want to attract talent, but you also want to retain talent. Losing talent is just as expensive or more expensive <coughs> than recruitment. You want it to be equitable. So, at minimum, you have to be compliant. However, you also want to be okay if all of your employees go out to a happy hour and they decide to tell each other what they all need. So it should be uh, transparent enough where you'd be, where you'd be okay with that. Uh, it promotes engagement, so you want people to feel valued, they want to feel like they're appropriately compensated so that they give you their best effort at work. Has anybody ever felt undercompensated? Are you excited? Are you pumped about going to work and, and staying that extra 15 minutes to finish up what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, so you want to, compensation needs to be a tool for engagement and retention, of course, and then promoting high performance. So a compensation philosophy is just a document that provides some clarity, guidance, and transparency around why you're choosing to structure your compensation package in the way that you are. There's tons of variables that we'll dig into in terms of your options on how to 
not only create structure but also deliver verbally and written how your company has come up with your current compensation philosophy. So there's four main buckets of compensation. One is market pay, and we'll dig into all of these in greater detail, but market pay, equal versus equitable, or more commonly maybe merit-based pay, flexible pay, and tailored pay. So market pay. A lot of you are bio bioinformatics companies, and that's not included on here, but I did grab some titles from the Research Park Job Board to put in here. But however, when you're thinking about different job descriptions and how you need to think about going about pricing them, I would think about them in terms of if it's a talent surplus role or if it's a job surplus role. So said another way, are there more job opportunities out there than there are talent? If there are, then that is going to be a job that's likely going to have more of a market premium. Uh, and then, of course, it'll be more, and so you have to be more incentivized if that is also a specialized role. So, to dig into this chart just a little bit, um, someone <laughs> that is an engineering manager, this I think is the maybe less intuitive role in here, an engineering manager being in the upper left instead of the upper right, and, the, and as well as data science, for example. And that is because there's multiple paths into engineering management, and there's likely there's there's likely less engineering management roles than there are engineering lead or principal engineer. And so the paths that funnel into engineering management make the talent make it a talent surplus. And the companies that are hiring typically hire less management roles. Does anybody have specific questions? Like, is, is this confusing, or does this generally make sense? Is that okay? So we'll dig into market pay as well. But the, this is how I would categorize some of these titles. So equitable pay. And this, this is directly correlated with retention. <laughs> so if you have a high performer, the equitable thing to do is to pay them more when it comes to their output. So if employees, and that goes back to the first graph, the red and the blue, that if you have somebody that's, their output is far greater, maybe they have a similar title, but their compensation should reflect their specific output. And this is super important when it comes to retention, given that, let's say that you have one of those happy hours, everybody turns over their cards, one person is clearly the top performer and finds out the pay is exactly the same as maybe somebody that's a low or, or an average performer. So if you haven't thought about equitable pay when you're thinking about the outcome, it's a great thing to do and by far the best retention strategy that you can have. And so you can think about this in terms of how much would it cost me if my best person left. So, what's common right now is that instead of asking for a raise, somebody will say, uh, you know, I got a counter offer. I interviewed and got a counter offer at a new company. And you, as a company, your goal is to prevent them from even wanting to interview. So, if your top performer were to leave, how much would it cost you? And then now you think about how can I reward that person with a certain percentage of how much it would actually cost me? Because if they left, and it is an aggressive market, so it's, it's realistic that they could leave, then you think about some type of retention, proactive retention strategy, rather than reactive when they come to you with a counteroffer, and at that point, it's pretty late in the game. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the main way that people ask for raises, is by getting a counteroffer. And that's not where you want your top performers to be. Not, you don't want them in that mindset of interviewing, and you also don't want them getting to the point where they actually have a counter offer. So you have these three main variables to work with when it comes to compensation. You have freedom, cash, and equity. 
So let's say that you are a company that just doesn't have a lot of cash at its disposal. And as a startup, you have equity to offer. So you have this other long-term incentive to be able to compensate with. And that makes up for maybe a higher base salary or some type of a total cash compensation. On the other hand, maybe you have low cash and low equity. You have to figure out a way to give that person more freedom. In an aggressive hiring market, you can't. You have to have some levers and strategies to pull. So maybe the the popular thing then is the four hour, or sorry, not four hour, the four day work week, where you can't give them this cash, but you can give them some of their time back. You can give them some of the conveniences that maybe they could have bought. You could have more project autonomy. So I'll talk about Amazon a little bit later because they're easy to pick on in some ways, but they don't give free. They give high cash and equity offers, but it's known to be more of a time demanding place to work. So these are the levers that you have to work with. So you'll hear a lot about total compensation. Well, my total compensation package is 700,000. And you're like, what? <laughs> How did you get an offer for 700,000? That seems amazing. And so companies are, are all structuring this a little bit differently currently. And so you need to not only be able to understand how other companies are doing it, but you also need to be able to craft your own in a logical way, not in a tricky way. So the clear ones are base salary and bonus. Everyone's heard of those, right? Base salary and bonus. But there's a lot of details within them. So with bonus, you can have long-term and short-term, but most are based off of a mix of company, team, and personal performance. And so you have to, in your compensation philosophy, you need to be able to articulate how that bonus will be achieved. If it's vague or unclear, <coughs> it makes the employee feel like they're not going to get that bonus and they should they should basically write it off unless a mini miracle happens. Mm -hmm. So, and another component of this is clawback research, which we'll get into more, which is the timing and when you decide to give those bonuses. And the point of this is to show you that you might think that a total compensation package is a base salary plus bonus, but it's not. There's tons of options and variables that you have within here to make it interesting for different types of people that could be joining your company. So a sign-on bonus is another lever that you can pull, of course. And what's usually very advantageous about a sign-on bonus is that you're able to maintain a certain level of base salary equity <laughs> without increasing somebody's overall base salary. So they're brand new, they haven't proven themselves, but you need to get them in the door. So it's a way to increase their year one salary or their year one total compensation without actually increasing the long-term payment. One thing too that I've found is a lot of candidates don't understand this or haven't fully thought through. Hmm. You know, they, they forefront their minds base salary and maybe like your bonus target, but especially if you have equity, RSUs, anything like that. I've, I've been on a lot of calls where you get asking and having a conversation with them and they start seeing the light of like, oh wow, I didn't think about my investing and my RSUs not having that anymore. And then it's like I'm wasting my time talking to this person, you know, we're 50, 75 grand apart. So well, do a little education with them. <laughs> And that's, that's a role that you need at your company is somebody that can educate people on, on the compensation and, and offers because they are more complicated now. And especially if you're hiring newer grads and they've never had equity and they haven't dealt with these different types of bonuses, they're going to look at their base salary potentially and, and that's going to be what's important to them. And so... In the offer process, it's very important to have an educational component and take the half hour and actually walk people through what 
what their actual offer letter says. So now equity is a big one because <coughs> if you're competing with like what you said, larger companies, they're going to be offering RSUs typically as a part of the compensation package. And what's super important with RSUs, uh, and I like Amazon a lot as, as this because they're top competitor and they pay a lot, but they also have some flaws. And so with RSUs specifically, it's important to walk candidates through how they actually get those RSUs and at what timing. So with Amazon, for example, they don't offer the bulk of their RSUs until year three and year four. So that means that if this candidate says, well, I got an offer for 700,000 from Amazon, that means they're selling them all of their stock on day one that they don't get until they've been there for four years. And so it's important to know where your candidates are also interviewing so that you can not convince them, but you're just showing them the, the details of the compensation packages. They kind of have to convince themselves at the end of the day. Even I as a recruiter, I do some convincing, but at the same time, you're looking for people that are a long-term fit, and a short-term convincing isn't, isn't the strategy. But the education in terms of how stock options actually work, when they come to fruition, um, a lot of Amazon employees are leaving right now because their stock has dipped, and what was a $700,000 package is completely based off of, not completely, a high percentage is based off of their stock price. And so, and that's very different from a startup where you have equity and a strike price, which I won't dig into a ton, we went over this in the last presentation, but you, the point here is that you have to educate your, your candidates in terms of what the options are. And then most of you, maybe minus Abbott, have an option with healthcare. So you can give a stipend, you can give a company plan, but it's important at least to realize that you have more options. And then I've been getting this question a lot when it comes to healthcare specifically, having a pending period or granting your healthcare on day one. Most of the companies that have asked me this question, I ask them back, well, how much are you saving? Like, are you saving a crazy amount of money by delaying healthcare by 30 or 60 days? And they're like, no. And maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like um, kind of getting off on the wrong foot with your brand new employee if you're delaying healthcare in any way when it's typically not a, a big cost savings. So last but not least, it's super popular for startups to have unlimited paid time off. Most people are seeing through the light of this and uh, this article here, which you will get a link to this presentation, but it basically says that Goldman Sachs is using this for evil and not for good. And most people aren't, aren't ignorant to this anymore. Five years ago, unlimited paid time off, it was so cool. But now it's known as, okay, I don't get paid out if I were to leave the company. And I'm not really sure what's mine. I might have two weeks. I heard this person took seven weeks. Does that mean I can take seven weeks? Well, I don't really know my manager that well. It'd be super awkward to ask for seven weeks. And so it's it's no longer something that you can just say. If you have an unlimited paid time off policy, you need to tell them why. And you need to tell them roughly what is theirs and some precedent has, that has been set. It's in some companies, it's truly a way to take advantage of, uh, of employees, and so you need to, if you have that policy, you need to articulate it well. For a full list of total compensation of what you can include, there is a link to that, but these are kind of the main, the main hits. Any questions? Do I recommend having a clip? Yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm not the best person to answer that question. The standard is to have a one-year clip. I think that that makes sense. You might know more about it than me. You're a startup owner, and I'm not. So, a one-year clip. 
likely makes sense because they have to stay one year <laughs> to get it, and you can at least give one year, in my opinion. Yeah, I would support one year, at least a 90 day. Like, like you said earlier, you're looking for long term fit. You're going to churn people that, that first year. You don't want to be messing with trying to get like micro portions of options to folks who were there for 90 days and balance. So, yeah. yeah, that would hurt my heart to give away a little bit of equity to somebody that stayed for three months. Okay, this is what I'm, I think is super interesting. So clawback research. It's the, it's a new theory, and this was published in 2021, this paper, that basically says that people are, psychologically, they don't want to have to give back something that they already have or lose something that they already have versus never receive something that they, that they never had. Okay, so what that means when it comes to bonuses, most companies pay out their bonuses in December of that year or Q1 of the following year, meaning that you hit your target for 2022 and you will reap those benefits in Q1 of 2023. And that's a retention strategy typically for most companies because that means you have to stay a quarter of the next year in order to get your, what you deserve for the previous year. So that's the thought process there. The newer, well, and then once you're there a quarter of a year, well, I'll just stay to the half. And then, well, now I need my 2023 bonus. And so the clawback research says the opposite. If you give someone their 2022 bonus in January, give them a very specific set that they need to set up instructions or results that they need to achieve to keep that bonus, that it's far more likely that not only do they feel valued and trusted, but they end up achieving those results. So if you actually had to ask somebody to pay it back, it would be super awkward. However, that's the same thing that's done with sign-on bonuses, for example. If you give a sign-on bonus, 10k to get somebody to join and they leave in five months you expect them to pay back a decent amount of that sign-on bonus so it's not that different but it is a different way to think about your philosophy and it could be a differentiating factor instead of having this version of handcuffs where you have to stay in order to get your 2023 or 2022 yeah back. so do you recommend like in that instance if if Normally you get a bonus after the fact, but it depends on several buckets, like how well the team and the company did, and then how well you did. But you don't know how well the team or the company are gonna perform, that's a guess. Do you recommend like picking an average or deciding that it will be like the best they could have done or somewhere in between? Like how do you, the buckets that are out of, you know, assuming that the employee does average work, fine, but what about the other component, the other two thirds that you can't control at all? Do you, how do you make a guess on that? I would think it could only whoop, only be based on individual performance if you were going to do it that way. Is my is my hunch. I don't know the answer. This is this is even a new concept to me. It's just something that I came upon this year. However, it's a differentiator. If you say it, and it builds trust, I think. Like, you no, know, we trust that you're going to do a good job. You did awesome in our interview process, and. That's what I think the value is, a differentiating factor in a trust building mechanism. You could, you could, you could structure it like an annual, almost like an annual signing bonus. Yeah. So if you get like 80% of your bonus target with clawback clause, and then the company overperforms, they get you know that next 20% plus whatever triggers above that. Yeah. But you get cash on hand. So. But I, I like the idea. It's, it's, I think it's a differentiator is the main, the main perk of it. Speaking of perks. So one of the most annoying things that I see in offer letters is that a company tries to create a cash equivalent for all of their perks. So your offer letter, your salary is 100000 and your 
bonus is twenty thousand, but your total compensation is really one hundred fifty thousand because you have thirty thousand dollars of perks. And you're like, what? I don't have a dog. <laughs> and so you that I know one one specific company that does this, and it's it's really confusing in the offer letter. It seems like. They're trying to inflate it, artificially inflate it. And so most people want just direct communication and they can decide what perks are good for them. Not everybody cares about a lot of these perks. <coughs> Not everybody cares about meals with office, etc. And so equating these with a cash amount and, and buffing up your offer letter, I think is a, it seems sketchy for lack of a better word. Did you have memories? No, no, no. Oh. sorry. <laughs> so perks are awesome, but I don't think that they should be used in order to buff up an offer letter. I think that they should be used to demonstrate your culture. Okay, how to price a role. In the previous presentation, we went over how to do this from a paid perspective, but nobody wants to pay for it. You'd rather do it for free, for sure. And so a free version, these are my two favorite ways to go about it. So step one, you see if the job is in demand. Everyone is typically looking for software engineers, and so <coughs> you want to see if there's essentially a job surplus. The reason why we look in the U.S. and not in Chicago or Champaign-Urbana is because it is a remote world. How many, does anybody here know somebody that lives in Champaign but works for a company that's headquartered somewhere else remotely? No one does? One person, two people? Okay. So, <laughs> it's, it's not a local economy at this point for jobs that can be done remote, and so you need to think about your compensation strategy from a national perspective. If you don't like your LinkedIn or don't think that it's accurate, then the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a decent amount of information on demand per job titles. They do have some funky titles if you decide to go in there. For example, they call a software engineer a computer information scientist. So you need to you need to know the synonyms, but it's all there in terms of the data to determine if a role that you're recruiting for is in high demand, and if so, how do you price it? So levels.fyi has come a long way in the past year. They've gathered an incredible amount of data, and this is specific to mostly tech. So if you're outside of tech, You'll have to email me and I can give you a different database. However, Levels has a crazy amount of data that you can work with. So I went to Levels yesterday and filtered out for a mid-level software engineer with two to five years of experience in Chicago. And Chicago is a reasonable area to be able to compare to, just given it's a driving distance at minimum from Champaign. And maybe you guys don't know them, but I know people that live in Champaign that work for Chicago companies. And so if you do that, the median is 130 with a total compensation of 147. And that seems like, that seems about right. But then if you wanted to get even more specific, you can download into a CSV file all of the data, and then you can get the average or the mean if you prefer that number. Dead. So that's that takes maybe 30 minutes in order to go through and price out roles that way. And that's all employee reported. If you are looking at databases, for example, <coughs> AngelList, that is company reported compensation data. I typically increase it by 20% because almost no companies put their max range out there at, uh, on a job description. Okay, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. This would be an example if your market, if your compensation philosophy was to pay at 50% of market, then this would roughly be around the offer that you would send for software engineers. <laughs> Thank you, that was not clear. Okay, so some pitfalls to avoid early on when thinking about your compensation package is lack of title consistency. As you grow, it gets increasingly messy. And so you want to think about how you are going to give titles. 
Um, you want to avoid things like he or she or they are the head of head of marketing because there's nothing that can go above a head of. So you use president, vice president, director, etc. Uh, and then lacking career progression ideas. Your top performers want to be promoted. They want to get more challenging options. And so if you don't give it to them, then other companies will. And then equal pay for unequal performance. OK, so this is, well, I think, the last slide. Walmart is known to be a super, super frugal company. Has anybody else heard that? Their executives are only allowed to eat sandwiches for lunch. They don't get lobster like at other companies. And Walmart is very interesting because as they were getting successful in the 60s and 70s, Sam Walton was telling his wife, Helen Walton, how, oh, we were able to give our executives this amount of bonus and profit sharing and I'm taking home this much this year, like, life is great. And she says, well, what are the associates getting? And he says, well, nothing. And she's like, huh, well, why don't you give, why don't you profit share with the associates who are typically hourly employees working at the store? And they're not called associate, associates by coincidence. They wanted a, a term that indicated a partnership. And a partnership equals profit sharing. And so he decided, Sam decided, that he would start, after one year, a one-year cliff, he would start actually giving stock or cash, Walmart stock or cash, into the employee's company account, if the, depending on the success of their store, so a percentage of the, of the success of their store. So what happened, and Sam is notoriously a very frugal person, what happened was he started paying his associates more. However, his store skyrocketed. The customers were treated better because the associates wanted them to come back because they wanted loyal customers. And the management treated the associates better as everyone reaped the benefits for higher performance. And so that's actually one of the reasons why Walmart was able to do so well and gain such a loyal customer base and innovative ideas from the bottom up is due to a pretty generous profit sharing package. Uh, and so then Home Depot then studied this specific component of Walmart and they copied their strategy as well. And so it's an example of a super, super successful company that started profit sharing with the, with the most entry level employee and then how that turned out. So, in creating this presentation, I came across some great resources that have a ton of HR and compensation data in them. If you would like to take a look, if you have more questions, so these are the two top ones. The full notes are here, and you'll get this as an email if you register. And then uh, these are ideas in terms of the next workshop, if, if you want to cast in your vote for what would be, what would be more helpful. So thank you, thank you very much.